coming up on this episode of Inside the Epicenter. Okay, so we're gonna bless Israel, but not only Israel, right here we see that all the families of the earth have a chance to be blessed through what God's gonna do through Abraham and his descendants. So it's not just Israel, it's Israel and her neighbors. Joel, it's great to have you on this episode where we're going to talk about something that I think is remarkable and deeply impacting our daily lives, even if we don't really understand what it is, whether we live in Israel or we live in the United States or anywhere in the world, the Abrahamic covenant of Genesis 12 and uh, the idea that really formed the root of the Joshua Fund's perspective on this region to bless Israel and her neighbors in the name of Jesus. So, Joel, welcome. And uh, maybe we can talk a little bit about your perspective on the Abrahamic covenant. First of all, what is it? Happy to do it, Carl. Absolutely. Let's read it. Um, You find it in Genesis chapter 12, and it's an incredibly important passage. I'm going to read it, and then we'll give it context in a moment. But let's actually hear the word of God. Genesis chapter 12, we're going to read three verses beginning in verse 1. Now the Lord said to Abram, go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, and so you shall be a blessing, and I will bless those who bless you and the one who curses you. I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And that is the covenant, but it's important to hear just a little bit more, starting in verse 4. So Abram went forth as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot, uh, his uh, nephew, went with him. Now Abram was 75 years old when he departed from the city of Haran. Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his nephew, and all their possessions which they had accumulated, and, their, and all the people and, that they had with them, and they all set out for the land of Canaan, and thus they came to the land of Canaan. And Abram passed through the land as far as the site of Shechem to the oak of Moreh. Now the Canaanite was in the land, and the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants... I will give this land. So Abram built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. Now that's an interesting passage because that is a game-changing moment in the book of Genesis. Mm. What you have in Abram is a pagan. Okay, this is not a believer. He's not an evangelical. <laughs> this is a guy who the Bible tells, if you look at other passages, this is a guy who comes from a family of pagans. They worship multiple gods. He's a polytheist. I think we read that his father actually created idols. Hmm. And he suddenly has an encounter with the living God who starts a personal relationship with him. I mean, he's 75 years old. He doesn't have any children. He's married. He doesn't have any children. And God says to him, listen, I'm going to do something very special in your life, Abram. I need you to move. (laughs) I'm going to take you to a place, and I'm going to show it to you, but I'm going to take you to a new land. I'm going to give you that land. I'm going to give you children, and I'm going to bless you, and you're going to become a great nation. In fact, you're going to become many nations, actually, and I'm going to do something through you that's really extraordinary. I haven't done it through anybody else, and your name is going to be great, Mm. and people who bless you they're going to be blessed. Now, if somebody tries to curse you, people try to curse you, I'm going to need to curse them as a response. But through you, Abram, you who were a pagan, who were a polytheist, who, were, who wasn't, who, you were an idol worshiper, I'm going to create a personal relationship with you, and I'm going to bless you, and through you, I'm going to do something where it'll be eventually, people can actually say, wow, all of the families of the earth had an opportunity to be blessed because of what God did starting in you. Wow. So biblically, that's the beginning of this special 
unique relationship, this sovereign relationship that God chooses Abraham and makes the statement about blessing those that bless this um, covenant and this relationship. So how did that influence your understanding of the nature of Israel and uh, its relationship to the countries, the uh, Arab countries around? Right. Well, when we started the Joshua Fund in 2006, Carl, Lynn and I and our initial you know, founding board felt it was very important to create a mission statement that captured as succinctly as we could what we believed theologically about this part of the world. And so we talked about we want to educate and mobilize Christians to do what? To bless Israel and her neighbors in the name of Jesus according to Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. Now, for some who would be uninitiated, that seemed a little clunky, hard to put on a mug, hard to put on a pen. It's on my water bottle. Hard to put on a license plate. Right? Oh, there you go. There's the Joshua. <laughs> right. right. So what were, what were we trying to do there? We're trying to say that our focus is on educating and mobilizing Christians to do certain things, to bless Israel. Now, it would take longer, and we do that, and it's part of what the podcast is about and everything else. What does it mean to bless Israel? Okay, that's important, but blessing Israel is a biblical principle, and it starts right here in Genesis 12, okay? And it carries on from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob, and Jacob, of course, is the grandson of Abraham, who God renames Israel. So, okay, so we're going to bless Israel. But not only Israel, right here we see that all the families of the earth have a chance to be blessed through what God's going to do through Abraham and his descendants. So it's not just Israel, it's Israel and her neighbors. Then we said, well, we need to make it clear that we're evangelicals, that we believe in Jesus. So we're not, you know, you could make that same statement and you could be an Orthodox Jewish organization or whatever. But mm -hmm. we thought, no, well, let's make sure we're doing it in the name of Jesus, right? That's what Jesus says, if anybody prays in my name, you know, so forth. So we wanted that to be clear. And then we said, but let's actually put the Abrahamic covenant right in the mission statement and not call it the Abrahamic covenant, just point people to it by putting the address of the scriptures. Look, in this passage, God does several important things. He says, he chooses a person. He says, I'm going to create a nation. I'm going to give them a land. I'm going to make Abraham's name, the, the patriarch's name, great. I'm going to bless him. I'm going to bless anybody that blesses him. And I'm going to bless other people through him. So that sets into motion all these things that lead to the foundation of the state of Israel, the creation of the land of Israel, the people of Israel, all come from Abraham. And Abraham, of course, is a very famous name, right? Uh, we even have peace treaties being named now the Abraham Accords because Abram is revered as the patriarch, as the founder, as the father of the Jewish faith, the Christian faith, but Muslims also revere him as one of their patriarchs. So interesting. It's interesting, by the way, it's a separate podcast, but the concept that Muslim leaders are naming the peace treaty with Israel, the Abraham Accords, suggests a fundamental disagreement over who Abraham is and what he did. Because if you go with the biblical version, then you're affirming that God gave this land to the Jewish people. Yeah. Not entirely sure that's what the crown prince of the United Arab Emirates or the king of Bahrain or the leaders of Sudan or the king of Morocco intends. Right. I think they're coming at it from their angle, what the, how they see Abraham. But nevertheless, they still see it as peaceful. But, so. but that brings up so many interesting avenues. And you're right. I mean, we're, we need another podcast episode or two to cover, you know, what that implication is for the modern understanding of uh, the story of Abraham and, and that. But if we stay in the Bible and we stay with what God did in this covenant, talk a little bit about why this separates, if you will, the Jewish people and through the Jewish people, the Christian uh, story of Jesus from all other peoples of the world and and talk a little bit about what that what that really looks like for those of us who, who are living uh, in the modern 21st century world of so many other nations. Sure. Well, there's a couple ways to look at it. And uh, let's 
we'll try to keep it brief and then you can keep pulling on the threads that you the direction you want to go in let's start with the fact that the first son that abraham had and by the way he's renamed from abram to abraham and right. sarai's name renamed by god sarah so okay that's why i'm using those terms but the first son abraham has he actually has with an egyptian handmaiden or, 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 or assistant to Sarah because they think we're old. We're never going to have children. There's no way that God's word can really come true. I mean, they're taking faith. They're actually going on the journey and they're heading into, into the land of Canaan, which becomes the land of Israel. That's, what we're, that's where I am now. But they didn't have the faith that they could have children. At one point, the Bible says, we were good as dead, essentially. That the, the, the phrase "good as dead" was the the term. Her womb was good as dead. Abram was. They, these, they were not going to have children. At some point, he's ninety. She's, I think, eighty, something like that, seventy-five. So, Sarah, in a lack, a moment of a lack of faith, says, "Hey, why don't you sleep with my assistant? You know, my secretary, my maid, my you know, just go sleep with her, and then you'll have a kid, and then uh, and then that'll that'll fulfill the word of God." Survey says. Eh. <laughs> <laughs> but he did it. He did it. And the son that came forth was named Ishmael. Mm. Now, unfortunately, many Christians think that God has cursed Ishmael. And, there, and, and it's, it's from Ishmael that we get almost all the tribes that have become the Arab peoples and the peoples all throughout the Middle East. Hmm. They come from Ishmael, and they themselves claim to be sons of, of Ishmael. Ishmael. Muslims claim to come from the, the line of Ishmael. So if you think that God cursed Ishmael, then you would start down a theological road that would cause a problem. But in fact, maybe that's another episode that we should do. Let's drill into that specific set of passage because there's a lot of problems going on in terms of Abraham, but God corrects them. He shows compassion on Hagar, the maid servant. He shows compassion on Ishmael, and he promises to make Ishmael, to bless him and to make him the head of 12 different tribes. Mm. He said, but you're not the chosen promised son of the promise of what I said I was going to do. Mm. So I'm going to bless you. It wasn't your fault, Ishmael, that this happened, but and I love you, and I will bless you, but, but you're not the one through whom I'm going to bring the global blessings because I don't want it to come out of sin. I want there to be a relationship that I supernaturally do. And so he, God supernaturally gives a actual natural-born child to Sarah, whose womb was good as dead, and that is Isaac. And Isaac eventually has Jacob, and, Jacob, and, and God specifically appears to each one of them, continuing to clarify that the line of the special promise is going from Abraham to Isaac, from Isaac to Jacob, and then through the line of one of Jacob's sons, Judah, and eventually we can trace it in the first chapter of the book of Matthew, chapter 1, it becomes, you, you see the connection, oh my goodness, Jesus is a direct descendant of Abraham through Isaac, through Jacob, through Judah. Wow. And eventually the King David, who's yeah. the king of the Jews. So that's where the line comes from. And so let me stop there and, and see, you know, yeah. feel free to pull on those threads. I don't want to go on. Well, no, I, I find it so fascinating. I think so many of our listeners would find it fascinating to hear so many of the names from our youth, our Bible stories as children, and to really kind of understand how this is, this is not uh, just nice stories or, but it's truly the roots and the branches of all of the situations that we see happening in this region, in the epicenter, uh, religiously and politically and socially. And, and uh, as evangelicals, you know, we need to stop, you know, sort of separating all these things out from the real world that lives and breathes around us. So you can see how Abraham and the Abrahamic covenant has created this really special relationship with God uh, for the descendants of Abraham, Jews, of course, Christians and Muslims. So is this why like Jerusalem and uh, the land of Israel is so sacred to all of those faiths? 
uh, for that and many other reasons, but it begins there, absolutely. And it's important to point out that what we just read from Genesis chapter 12 and continues to unpack throughout the book of Genesis and, and so forth, but it's an unconditional promise it's an unconditional covenant that God makes. A covenant's even a stronger word in the Bible than a, just a promise. Uh, it's a breach. A covenant is a something that you cut. You actually, uh, anyway, I go into all the theology of cutting a covenant, but you you actually have to shed blood of an animal to show that you are serious. Like this is a big deal. And in this case, it's a one-sided promise. Abraham doesn't negotiate with God. He doesn't say, listen, if you'll bless me and you'll give me a land and make me super wealthy and even famous, I'd like to be famous too. If you'll do that, I'll do some things for you. That's what we do. We're like, oh God, I'm, you know, I didn't, you know, I'm really sick. And, but if you'll heal me, then I'll give my life savings all to the church or, you know, whatever. I mean, we have all kinds of deals we make with God. That's not what happened. God sovereignly chose Abram, who was a pagan. You know, he's not like he's a godly man and he's being rewarded for being godly. He's not godly. He's a pagan, but he doesn't know any better. He's ignorant. But God says, okay, I, I can fix that. I'm going to reveal myself to you, Abram, and I'm going to do something very special with you. But all the promises are unconditional. You don't hear what you hear when you study the law of Moses. In the law of Moses, which comes much later in the Bible, God says, look, Look, nation of Israel, if you do this, I'll do that. But if you do this, I'm going to have to do that. Mm -hmm. There are if-thens for blessings, same word, and curses. And But that's not what's happening. These are not a series of if-then statements. God is just saying, I'm going to do this. In fact, you, we, I, I emphasize it when I read it. I will do this. I will do this. I will do this, and this shall happen, and this shall happen, and this shall happen. God has sovereignly decided that a certain set of things are going to happen. So he's sovereignly decided that he's choosing the Jewish people to bless us. He's giving us a land. He's going to use us to bring the Messiah, you know, and which is Jesus. And we see that in the New Testament, even from the first chapter of Matthew. And through Jesus, everybody in the world has a chance to be blessed and have a personal relationship with God, just like Abraham had, and even better. Because God has expanded upon the explanation of the promises of, of what you get. Now, Abram had faith. The Bible says he had faith. He believed God. Now, he was imperfect. There were moments that he stumbled. But when he was told this promise, he said, I believe that. And God put a credit in his account, as it were, and said, because you believe me, I'm going to credit you as righteous, Abram. And when we believe in Jesus, the promise that he made us, that if you repent of your sins and believe that he died on the cross to pay a penalty for our sins, that he only he can pay our penalty, we can pay it ourselves and go to hell and pay forever, or we can accept the payment that he made and have our sins forgiven and go to heaven forever and ever and ever. If we believe that, if we receive that, and we believe that God raised Jesus from the dead as proof that he's the Messiah, that he's the very one that was set into motion from the line of Abraham, then we'll be blessed. And that means going to heaven forever, having peace in our hearts today, having wisdom from above, so on and so forth, all the blessings of the New Testament. So that's why it's important. And what's interesting is the Abrahamic covenant is never rescinded in the New Testament. It's repeated and affirmed. Jesus affirms it. Yeah. Stephen affirms it in, in, in um, Acts chapter 7 when he, he's giving a sermon right before he's martyred by the Jewish leaders who did not get this. But Stephen makes the case for the Abrahamic covenant in the New Testament. And he doesn't say, well, that's over with now. He says, no, no, because, right, because Jesus has already been crucified. He's already been rejected by the Jewish leaders. But Stephen doesn't say, you had a chance, but you blew it. I mean, he does say, you blew it, but he doesn't say the Abrahamic covenant was taken away. It can't be taken away. Why? Because it was unconditional. Mm, fascinating. God just has said, I'm going to do it. I happen to be doing it through Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, but I'm doing it. And nobody can stop me. Yes. So, 
And it's reaffirmed by Paul multiple times, including in Romans chapter 9, 10, and 11. So I say all that because there are some people who believe theologically that because Jewish people rejected Jesus in the first century, that God has now rejected the Jewish people en masse, that he's done with us, he's over with us, he's replaced us as the apple of his eye, mm. he's got no plan for us, and that he's done with all the promises that he made, the covenants that he made. Yeah. But that's inaccurate. It's a yeah. misreading of the whole counsel of God. Yeah, that's not what the text says. And obviously, I think, too, you can see through the story of the Abrahamic covenant and God's unconditional love and blessing that this land, that this line is so important to so many people. Uh, we're going to take a quick break right now. And um, when we come back, I want us to kind of connect the dots between the ancient world and the modern world. You mentioned these Abraham Accords uh, today, and we're going to talk a little bit about that and how God has opened up opportunities for blessing that really no one could have imagined. So uh, thanks. Hi, this is Carl Muller, Executive Director of the Joshua Fund. I don't know about you, but I love to have someone to talk to after I've learned something new. If you're the same, share this podcast with a friend or family member and discuss together the many ways God is moving in the epicenter. From all of us at Inside the Epicenter with Joel Rosenberg, thank you. All right, Joel, we were talking just a few minutes ago about this Abrahamic covenant, this blessing that God gave to Abraham and, and the important and historic connections to the Jews, the Christians globally, and the Muslims. So let's talk a little bit about the current state of things in the epicenter, in Israel and her neighbors. Uh, with these, Can I make one point first yeah, before sure. we go into that? Because I think it's super relevant. It's, it, the, a few years before you came on board, Carl, uh, the Joshua Fund helped finance a sweeping survey of American evangelicals. Now, admittedly, we didn't do a global survey, but okay, we the most the most number of evangelicals in the world are in the United States, uh, in terms of one particular country, and we did this survey to try to understand how do American evangelicals see the Abrahamic Covenant, how do they view the Jewish people, the Palestinian people, the peace process. And so forth. Fascinating, fascinating. What we found was that 80%, 80%, 8 in 10 American evangelicals believe the Abrahamic covenant was an unconditional promise to the Jewish people. 80%. Mm. What stuns me about that, and by the way, we did that survey with, it, it wasn't just us, that we were helping finance. It was a survey done with the Alliance for the Peace of Jerusalem, which is a coalition of various evangelical scholars and seminary professors and presidents and so forth, and a ministry called Chosen People Ministries, a uh, wonderful dear brother, uh, Mitch Glazer, whose idea the survey was. So what was interesting about it was as we processed that, uh, all these different scholars, we thought, who is teaching the Abrahamic Covenant today? I mean, why does 80% of American evangelicals believe it? Now, I, I wish it was 100 I was shocked that it was 80, because I am not aware that it's getting widely taught. Mm. Somebody's learning it somewhere. I'd be curious. I don't know. I honestly don't know the answer to that question. None of the, none of the scholars or the heads of the seminaries or Bible colleges, none of them knew. They're like, well, that's a good point. We teach it here, but we don't really emphasize it. We don't. It's not a thing, but 80%, that's a good number. So that's important. And I think the, uh, the other thing to realize is this idea that it is unconditional and it continues on through the New Testament, that it gets reaffirmed many, many times. And that's, it's not always explained in great detail. There's an assumption in the New Testament that you know what the Abrahamic covenant is and what its implications are, but it keeps getting reaffirmed. It never is rescinded. And I think that's an important thing for all believers to understand, especially as we educate through this podcast and other ways. Hmm, that, I guess that's a thing. It's such a super important element 
so early, Genesis chapter 12, so early in the Bible, and it gets reaffirmed right through the end of the New Testament. So now we can talk about some of those implications, but I will say that our Palestinian Christian friends, and, and there are others who say, well, no, that is not operative today. So not every evangelical believes it, but 80% do, and we do at the Joshua Fund, but we don't want to get in a fight over it, but we're happy to have a conversation over it. Whether we believe it or not, it still impacts the entire region as far as uh, those that understand uh, the Abrahamic covenant to be unconditional and those that understand it uh, in a different way. What, though, does that have to do with these uh, current peace initiatives that many of the Arab countries around Israel have undertaken? And why would they call these peace treaties, the Abraham Accords. Again, you know, bring history into context for our current situation. Right. Well, I should note, Carl, as we go down that part of the road, that many Jews, I think the polling indicates that most Jews don't actually believe the Abrahamic Covenant. Now, most Jews here in Israel do believe they're living in the promised land, well, who was the promise to? Where does that term come from? It comes from God's promise to Abraham. But most American Jews don't actually believe it. They don't believe that Jews are the chosen people, mm. chosen in Genesis 12 and, and, and subsequent chapters. They don't believe, mostly, that Israel was given a land. I mean, that the Jewish people were given a land. Evangelicals believe it, and that's why the pro-Israel movement in America is not really driven by the Jewish community. It's driven by the tens and tens and tens of millions of evangelicals who believe these promises. Mm -hmm. They don't agree with every single thing that the Israeli government is doing on a day-to-day -day basis. They may even have some strong criticisms of things, as, as every Israeli has a strong criticism of our government. We're, uh, we're, uh, we're, we're quite the feisty democracy over here. But, <laughs> but it's important to know that that belief in the Abrahamic Covenant is the driver ultimately, in why evangelicals love Israel so much, because they believe this is a promise that has ongoing, it's like an aorist verb to go to Greek. It has ongoing implications. Uh, that's too arcane. But uh, now here, why? The interesting thing is I have done my reporting. I understand that it's the Arab leaders who wanted to call this agreement the Abraham Accords. Hmm. And I believe it specifically comes out of the United Arab Emirates. You may recall, uh, Carl, that uh, I think we talked about it on a previous podcast, but forgive me because we've been doing a lot of different ones, so maybe I didn't tell the story, but I was invited to sit with the Crown Prince of Abu Dhabi, which is the capital of United Arab Emirates. This was several years ago, before there was any talk publicly of peace between the United Arab Emirates and Israel. There was no talk at that time. But the Crown Prince, Mohammed bin Zayed, um, widely known in this region by his initials, M-B-Z, he invited me to bring a delegation of evangelical Christian leaders to get to know him, to spend time with him, to understand the reforms that he and his team were making in their country. And so we went and we sat with him in his palace for two hours. So fascinating. In Abu Dhabi, the capital of the UAE. And this was in the fall of 2018. Okay, two full years before the Abraham Accords. Long story short, we went through this thing with him and we said, listen, we, we want you to know that as evangelicals, the Bible commands us to love Israel and the Jewish people. So we do. Um, we want you to know that. Two, we want you to know that God commands us to love our neighbors. So we love the Palestinians. We love Arabs. We love Muslims. We don't see it as either or. We see it as both and in terms of God's love and his heart of compassion. And third, we're, you know, we're commanded to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And we haven't really seen a peace treaty between Israel and our Arab neighbors in, at that point, close to 25 years. So we think that whoever is the Arab leader that makes peace with Israel next is going to be deeply appreciated by American evangelicals. It's the right thing to do, and it will have big benefits <laughs> to the next Arab leader or leaders that do it. So would you ever consider making peace with Israel, even if the Palestinian leadership, for whatever reason, isn't ready yet. 
And the crown prince, Mohammed bin Zayed, MBZ, he leaned forward to me and stunned us all. But he said to me, Joel, I'm ready. We didn't have a talking point for that. We're like, what? That was just, we just wanted to say that. We weren't really expecting a, a yes. So we ended up having a fascinating conversation about why and what's the next steps? How do you get there? Now, he asked us to have that conversation off the record at that time. We couldn't come out of the palace and say, the United Arab Emirates is going to make peace with Israel. And we heard it straight from the leader himself. Couldn't do it at that time. So, but we knew it and we began to watch how might that play out. One of the things that intrigued me is that he, as a devout Muslim, believed that Abraham was a point of convergence, a point of, we all see him a little bit differently, but Jews, Christians, and Muslims, to go in order of how the, <laughs> how the religions uh, came out, all regard him so favorably, so positively. He's the patriarch of the whole thing. Mm -hmm. So he seemed to believe, he and his team, it would be good to call this agreement eventually the Abraham Accords because it's a point that brings us together. Yeah. Now, as I referred earlier, we didn't get into a conversation about, you know, that covenant gives us all the land. Are you, are, are you aware of that? <laughs> anyway, I'm glad he didn't. And he's also building now what's called the Abrahamic Faith Center. It's a massive complex where there's going to be a massive mosque, one of the largest, if not the largest church in the Middle East, and a synagogue. Wow. And they're calling that the Abrahamic Faith Center. Center. Wow. So this is just an interesting process. And that was not pushed back. You didn't see Muslims, Arab, other Arab leaders saying, that's the craziest way to call it ever. I would never sign on to that. No, you see a warmth towards it. Um, it's, so it's fascinating. There is an interesting one other point, Carl, and that is something that's not discussed much amongst evangelicals who love Israel and believe the land is all ours. I mean, I'm ours being Jewish and an Israeli, but, you know, who believe that the land is, should be all Israel's. Very little discussed among evangelicals who love Israel is that Abraham had a territorial conflict that he had to figure out how to resolve. His nephew, Lot, and his shepherds mm -hmm. were getting into a big fight routinely with Abraham because they... They had, a lot of, they had a lot of sheep, they had a lot of cattle, they had a lot of stuff. And there was, there was a conflict brewing. And so Abraham said, listen, let's, I mean, I'm paraphrasing, but I encourage people to go and study this, the passage. Let's just split the land. You take the part that you want and then separate from me. So there, there's some distance. And then you can live in peace. I'll live in peace. There's plenty to go around. And it, what part did Lot take? He took the Jordan River Valley, mm -hmm. which today is known as the West Bank. Right. The West Bank of what? The West Bank of the Jordan River. That is the area that the Palestinian Authority would be primarily centered on. And Abraham took, you know, the rest, as it were. And so it's an interesting question. And I don't, I'm not putting my foot down as this is the way, but it's an interesting concept to think, did Abraham, it, Abraham had personally promised the land. Why did he offer to give some of it away? Now, you could argue maybe he wasn't allowed to do that, but he did. And why did he do it? To separate from people that he was having tensions with and think, you know what? We don't need to have these tensions. You be there. We'll be here. It's enough. And that was how he handled it. Now, you don't normally hear. I, I've literally never heard a single yeah. pastor or Christian Zionist say, maybe that should be our way. But I just put that out there in the context of this Abrahamic discussion to say, Abraham eventually got all the land back. And even now, we don't have all the land that he was promised, right? I don't think that's all coming until Jesus comes and sets up his kingdom. But it is an interesting concept. It, should that be part of our peacemaking principles from the scriptures? Yeah. So I'll stop there. Well, we can see, you know, such an obvious example of how the biblical story relates directly to the current uh, situations there. And, you know, it's fascinating to hear how behind the scenes, this desire on the part of uh, the, some of the Arab countries 
to use Abraham as an example of the way this piece uh, can be worked out in this region. So we're, we like uh, many, uh, we at the Joshua Fund are going to continue to pray for the cause of Christ in this region, the Prince of Peace to rule uh, through all of these things. Joel, as we wrap up, what are some things that you think could be really important for our listeners to understand about how the Abraham covenant helps us bring uh, some healing and hope to a really fractured and broken part of the world? Well, I think the core of it is these themes that we've discussed, that God does choose a people and he does give them a land and he does say he'll bless them, but he also says he'll bless everybody else through them. And that's been true in a number of various ways. Certainly you have Jewish scientists who've come up with wonderful blessings and Jewish musicians and Jewish, you know, uh, filmmakers. And, you know, there's all kinds of, you know, NBA basketball players and <laughs> yeah, there you go. Uh, a lot of the elements in your phone mm-hmm. were invented here in Israel. A lot of things in your computer were invented here in Israel. There's a lot of blessings. But ultimately, what God is talking about primarily, not exclusively, but primarily, is that he's going to bring the Messiah and the gospel, the good news message, where everybody can know him personally, just like Abraham knew him. So that's the most important message. But this idea that God loves both sides, that he wants to bless everybody in the world, that God didn't, didn't choose Abraham to create some sort of super race of people that were super exclusive and had every benefit and nobody else was loved by God. That is ridiculous, and it's not biblical. In fact, God says multiple times in the scriptures, I think particularly in the, De- the book of Deuteronomy, as he's reaffirming to Isaac and Jacob the covenant that he makes, he's saying, just to be clear, it is not because you're more righteous than the other people mm that I'm giving you this land. Three times he says it in one chapter, I think Deuteronomy 9, but we'll, we'll double check that. But God's saying, I'm gonna take a flawed people and I'm gonna do something very special in them and through them. And we are very flawed people, my people, the Jewish people, but God loves us. And our job is to love him back <laughs> and share the good news of the special blessings that he gave us and the word of God, most importantly, that he gave through the Hebrew prophets and through the Jesus, to Jesus, the Jewish Messiah, and through the Jewish apostles, and take that word of God and give everyone a chance to hear it. And in the meantime, do what Jesus did. Care for the poor, care for the needy. I mean, we can't, most of us can't uh, supernaturally heal people, but we can bring medicines, we can bring doctors, we can, mm-hmm. if there's earthquakes, if there's disasters, if there's war, if there's famine, we can be there to be a blessing. And that's what the Joshua Fund is a part of. And that's what we do. And we need to strengthen the, the local believers who are under many hardships and face many challenges, including in some cases, outright persecution. And as you know, Carl, better than most, Christians have faced genocide in this region. Yeah. So these are the ways to that we have unpacked from the scriptures that how do you bless Israel and her neighbors? These are some of the ways. Wow. Well, Joel, I want to thank you again for another amazing insight, biblically, historically, and right now in the political space about what God is doing in the epicenter. And I, I'm just thrilled for the uh, the number of our listeners. Uh, I think over 300,000 so far, really just in starting of people who've heard the podcast and picked up on one of these episodes. I'm just so thrilled that we're going to be dealing with so many of the the deeper nuances and the stories from the region in future episodes. So on behalf of the Joshua Fund and uh, the work that Joel Rosenberg is also doing through Near East Media, I'm Carl Muller, the executive director of the Joshua Fund. And thank you all for listening to Inside the Epicenter with Joel Rosenberg. God bless you and thanks. Thanks.